Um, this is a, a part, this is a two part presentation effectively, although each of them is, is entirely uh, useful on its own. So they're both standalone classes as well. Uh, the one I'm doing today is, is about breathing for healing and recovery and, and how that works, because I'm, I'm fairly convinced that the more we know about why it might be effective, uh, the more we're likely to use it effectively. The next one is in July, and that will be Graham presenting that, and that will be more about getting moving again. So there's quite a, a long gap, and I'm hoping that in that time, maybe you've had a chance to implement some of this so that you feel like moving more when that one comes along. You certainly won't be pushed to do anything strenuous, but you know, just to get things back as much as possible to, to some kind of normal. That's what we're that's what we're aiming for anyway. So my job here today is to tell you why it is and to give some practice about breathing, how it's gone wrong, potentially, not for everybody, and why it is that it can make a difference. And really what I'm about is re-educating breathing. So if this isn't breath work in the sense that we've often heard about it, where you do exercises interventionally, which are fine, which are great, we do that too. But this is really to retrain breathing so that it's right so that you get it right on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's a very strong chance that if you have any kind of illness, a fatigue condition being one of them, that you may have problems with your breathing that you may not even notice. And the difficulty is we don't know which came first. We, we can never know that necessarily, or few people do because they're aware of how their breathing was before. But it could be that your illness is actually driving uh, somewhat dysfunctional breathing and that's no surprise if you think about it it's one of the vital signs used in hospitals to measure how uh, how people are but then nothing's done with it which is a shame because we do have some control over our breathing and that's quite exciting because it means we can make a difference to it um, if you're suffering from some kind of fatigue condition then you'll know that, that it's a multi-system condition with all sorts of different symptoms I've highlighted a few just to try and give you an idea as to why it is that breathing can make a difference to them. So fatigue is an obvious one to start with. Um, brain fog, sleep disturbances, uh, muscle and joint pain, shortness of breath, anxiety. That's probably enough to be going on with. I wanted to get a spread of different types of symptoms that seem not to be very in interlinked. If you are breathing too quickly, and it's, there is a good chance that that can happen when you have some kind of health challenge. So if you're breathing too quickly, then you will be feeding into clearly breathlessness, that the shortness of breath, that's an obvious one. But also other things, if you think about how you feel when you're stressed or anxious, you probably already know that you breathe quite quickly. The problem we have, if we have these conditions is, it becomes chronic. The breathing is already fast. The illness is partly behind that, or it may have already been there. We may have been breathing dysfunctionally and then got ill. So of course, then it's going to be uh, more challenging still. And this was the case for me. I was breathing dysfunctionally and probably have been or had been for most of my, I, I'm going to say adult life, but it could have been longer. I don't know. Certainly, um, we'll look into some of the reasons why so many of us are getting this wrong um, in a moment. In terms of breathing too fast, and by that I just mean too fast for your body's needs. So it won't feel wrong to you because it's your normal. But it will contribute to, um, as I said, the, the shortness of breath and the anxiety, but also the sleep disturbances. Because the same kind of fast breathing you take to bed with you. It doesn't disappear just because you're falling asleep. And in fact, it may stop you falling asleep because your body's now on alert because it's got this fast breathing, which sends a message to the brain saying, there's a threat, you need to be alert. So one of two things typically happens, and that's usually you can't fall asleep very easily or you wake up in the small hours of the morning one or more times so that, that you've then got insomnia potentially, uh, which I'm very familiar with. I feel like an expert on it after years of experiencing it and not the right kind of reason for, ha for being an expert either. Um, <clears throat> the other potential uh, dysfunction, for want of a better word, suboptimal characteristic of breathing, that's probably a nice way of putting it, 
is that the, the gas exchange doesn't take place as well as it could do because we don't breathe deeply enough. And there's a problem with deep breathing as well as a concept. There's, it's, it's absolutely a wonderful thing to do. But when we hear deep breathing, it's become part of our culture for some reason. And I, I'd love to know how it developed to meet to understand. We understand big breaths and this is not the case at all. A big breath and especially if you take several are likely to make you hyperventilate and also feel a little bit dizzy. It's not the case at all that these breaths need to be big. They need to be small, but they do need to go down to the lower lobes of the of the lungs where the gas exchange can take place so that tissues, muscles and organs can be oxygenated. And one of these organs is really key. It's your brain. Well, all the organs are key, but it's your brain. And of course, if, if that's a factor, if that's not happening, then brain fog is likely to be more pronounced. So it does seem odd that all of these things can be affected by breathing. But just to go back to stress, if your breathing is causing you some kind of chronic underlying stress, or if it's just in the background there and when you do get a bit stressed, it's worse than it needs to be, then of course that stress, we know stress can lead on to other illnesses or contribute to other illnesses. So it's not surprising that it can contribute to other symptoms of the fatigue conditions that we're talking about. The same with sleep. We know that sleep is so important for all sorts of reasons in terms of our health and well-being and that it can have detrimental effects on how we um, how we experience an, an, an illness or the fact that we get an illness sometimes so we don't know which came first as i've said it could be that the, the suboptimal breathing was already in place and then the illness came or it could be that the illness prompted the suboptimal breathing i'm going to focus mostly today on the hyperventilation because it's the one that is a most common in in these circumstances the one that's most prevalent rather i should say uh, and it's also the one that's perhaps more difficult to resolve but when you do then the others are likely to fall into place a little more easily so can i give you a few ideas as to why we might be getting it wrong why is it that if you uh, arrived on this on this um trajectory that you're on with with a with i don't know chronic fatigue it could be it could be long COVID, it could be fibromyalgia why is it that you may have dysfunctional breathing? Why is it that it might have started beforehand? Well, I've mentioned stress already. It could be that you had in, at some point a prolonged period of stress and that will have put you in that mode of breathing quite quickly. And it, it can become a habit. You, you don't necessarily consciously do it. So you're not going to consciously undo it when the stress has passed. So it may just be a hangover from a previous stressful event. Um, another thing, and, and this is quite an interesting one, it is modern diets. Now, I don't know if anybody has uh, read the, the book by James Nestor called Breath. It's, it's worth a read, it's quite interesting. He's an investigative journalist who discovered that he had, uh, he had a breathing dysfunction himself and really wanted to get underneath it all and find out what was going on. And as part of this, he went into these underground caverns in Paris and looked at various different skulls and they're ancient, some of them really old. And he found that any that were older than 300 years were quite different in shape to the ones that we have now. Our jaws tend to be set back a little bit. And this is partly because we don't have such, uh, su such work to do with our jaws which is kind of amazing really, that our food has become so soft and certainly in the last hundred years more so. And this then narrows the airway. It, me it means that there's less room to breathe. And in fact, some people are so challenged by it that they often walk around with their chin a little bit forward in an attempt to open up that airway. So that, that's one aspect of food, but also um, there are some foods you possibly know that the blood has a, a pH balance and it's supposed to be it's quite tightly controlled. So on the one hand, so the going down, you've got the acid balance and up it goes, it goes alkaline. It needs to be kept quite um, in, in, a, in a very narrow margin. And certain foods, um, processed foods in particular, 
if you eat a lot of animal food and even a lot of grains, this can put you slightly into the acid zone. These are acid forming foods and your body's going to have to rebalance and it's going to have to do it quickly. This is life or death, it has to. And whilst it can do it by flushing it out through the kidneys, that's a slow process. There's a much faster one, breathe it off. So that means then that you can, uh, your carbon dioxide that you're breathing off, um, if you do it quite quickly, which you probably would do fairly automatically, will get you back into balance. The problem of course is sometimes that goes too far. That breathing off tends to, uh, can put you into the alkaline zone. And then of course your body's like, well, I, even though you're not doing the thinking, I know what foods do that. It's those foods that put it the other way again. And so it goes and you're in this kind of fast breathing, eating not the most ad advisable foods in quantity. And so it, so it goes on, uh, which is kind of interesting in itself. But also overeating, that's probably obvious because if you've got a very full tummy, if you like, then the, your breathing apparatus are, is going to be a bit challenged. It, it, it's harder to breathe. But there are also other habits that form and they may not have anything to do with you personally. I don't know if you've ever noticed, there are certain, and I think we noticed it, I can't remember his name, one of the, I'm not into football. There's a football player who seems to have his mouth open a lot. Um, an open mouth is a really unfortunate way to breathe. It's going to actually contribute to lots of different problems. And as Harry Kane, that's how it is. Children watching that may, may see him as a role model and then, then that habit forms because they copy him. An illness can do it. If you've had a, a prolonged cold, for example, or if you have a, you know, a long period of, of um, allergy causing, you, causing your nose to be quite blocked, then mouth breathing can then become a habit as well. Uh, your posture makes a difference. How you sit or how you stand has an impact on your breathing and your breathing impacts on your posture. They, they, both, they go both ways. If you happen to have a job such as the one I used to have, which was teaching, then excessive talking can also contribute to breathing problems. And that's worth knowing because then you can do something about it if you know. Otherwise you get home from work and you feel exhausted and you think it's all the teaching you've done. And it kind of is, but it's got a lot to do with all the talking because inevitably your breathing's being quite fast it has to be through an open mouth because you're talking and you feel quite exhausted sometimes. And of course, there are a few anatomical challenges. Now, that, that's undeniable. Some people have uh, physical obstructions that, that possibly need some surgery. And a lot of us have, to some degree or other, a deviated septum. I think it's something enormous, like about 90 percent, which is huge. And it may be that if it's severely deviated, then that, that does present a problem but most of us are capable of breathing through the nose. It may be that we've just not got the habit of doing so and it doesn't feel easy um, if we're not used to doing that. So I'd like to have a go at finding out where you're up to personally with your own breathing. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to um, measure your own breathing efficiency. And for this, all you will need is a, a clock with a minute hand or a phone's stopwatch. So either of those will work. I won't be asking you to give your result, but you will know your result and I'll explain to you what that means. So I'll give you a moment to find, to find a clock or, a, or a, your, your watch may have a minute hand if you've got a watch on or your phone's stopwatch. And then it'll be a case of doing a, a kind of a very easy test. It, is, it really is quite easy. What I'll, I will ask you to do, I'll do this in a moment. So I'm presenting it first of all. I'll ask you to take a normal breath in through your nose and a normal breath out through your nose and then to pinch your nose and hold it and count the seconds until you get the first definite desire to breathe. And the definite desire to breathe may well come from your diaphragm. It's like a little twitch sometimes that people have. Everybody experiences this slightly differently. Or it could be something in your throat that, that, that kind of twitches sometimes too, or some other part of your breathing, or even it may be you've decided, I can't do this anymore. Sometimes it's, it's more in your head and that's fine too. It's still a measure of your own breathing efficiency. Um, and, and it's just a case of counting those seconds until the point where you let go again. You feel, I need to breathe and I have to let go. 
What this is not is, a, is a, it's not any kind of willpower test. That's a different test altogether. It's testing how, how, your, uh, how you respond, how your body responds to the, the lack of oxygen coming in. So the other key factor is the way you're breathing before you start should be how you're breathing when you finish. So that helps too, so that you know that if you're, you're breathing quite normally and gently now, hopefully, and at the end, you should be breathing in the same way. If you're, if you're gasping a little bit, then it's gone just a touch too far. So I'm hoping that's okay. I mean, if, if you want to give me a thumbs up, you're welcome to do so. And if not, we'll, well, uh, if I, I'll explain again if need be, but we'll, we'll, we'll crack on with this. Oh, great, thank you for that. Um, yeah. And if anybody's got any questions, please, please, please ask. Do you have a do you have a question there, Sarah? Can you just explain what you do again? I absolutely will. Yes, of course I will. So, you have you got a have you got a timing device handy? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to take a normal breath in through your nose and a normal breath out. So it's just breathing normally, and it's on the exhale that you pinch your nose and you hold it then for the number of seconds. So don't, don't do it just yet so because it will interfere with the real you, You're basically stopping yourself from breathing. Oh, so, so there. So yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, it's when your body tells you, I need to breathe again, that you let go and you check the number of seconds that you've been holding your breath for. Right. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will give, I will give you um, about, I'm going to say. Say 30, 30 seconds or so for this. That, so it's likely to be within that. So it's, oh, get, you your, get your timing device. Go on, sorry, say, say it again. You just froze then. Did I? Okay, I'm all right. Am I freezing? Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> have, I, have I come back to life? Yeah. Yes, okay, good. All right. So get your timing device ready to start. And take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose, pinch your nose and hold and count the seconds on your device until you, your body says it's time to breathe again. And that's your score. And, and I, sh I shall look away at this point. I don't need to watch anybody doing this test. Okay. okay, we're nearly up to about, yeah, about 30 seconds. Now, uh, you're very welcome to put your score in the chat if you want to, but I don't particularly need to know unless you want, unless you want to. That, that's up to you. Some people like to do that and that's fine. Um, it just it, it gives a bit of an indication, but I'm about to tell you what that, what that means anyway. Um, if you had, um, and remember your breathing should have been pretty much constant based on how you started. Uh, okay, yeah, that, that, that's useful to know. Yeah, good. Okay, now uh, that your the fu functional breathing is 25 seconds and above, and and I'm barely there yet, and I've been doing this for quite a long time. I'm I'm pretty I'm virtually there. 89 percent of people with 25 as their score tend to have functional breathing. They're they're back on track. If you have 20 and above it's looking good, you're getting there, you're making good progress and you, you would notice improvements. So I'm hoping that you will, if we do some exercise, that you will be able to practice that regularly and get there. Um, under 10, I, I would say that's the area that, that, that is getting a little bit, a, a little bit challenging. Um, but uh, so far I haven't seen any under 10s. It's not challenging in the, in the, uh, in the context of needing to worry about it. You can still do plenty of it, but there, there will be some exercises you absolutely shouldn't do. And whilst your control, this is called a control pause, whilst this test is still giving you a low score, if it's below 10, don't do any kind of breath holds. I know they're very, uh, there's a lot of them on the internet at the moment, that it could be potentially dangerous. And just for the record, if you're pregnant and you're in your first trimester, especially then then don't do any of these exercises either. You can still test your, your breathing efficiency, but exercises are probably best left until you're at least further on in the pregnancy. But nose breathing, you can do whoever you are and, and wherever you are, as long as you physically can do that. So 
that should give you an idea of where you're up to, where you're up to um and that's very uh, that, that's fairly typical for people with a, a condition like like fatigue um in fact some of them are particularly low I and mean, we have come across people who are so low it's about it's about three or two even uh, and they know it because they're breathless even at the end of a sentence um okay mm -hmm. yeah good so interesting to see and bear in mind as well those those of you who've especially because a lot of you are giving your scores and that's really really great thank you for doing that um don't be put off it actually happens that there are some really capable very accomplished sports people who do this test and their score is around 15 sometimes it's really low for what they do quite how they manage i don't know it must hurt but of course when they do retrain their breathing their life gets a little bit easier in terms of the sport that they do. So, so don't be put off. You, you, you've done well. It's, it's looking pretty good from what I can see. And definitely it can be improved upon, which is really exciting. So if you have got the uh, traits of dysfunctional breathing, then th these are the things to look out for and become aware of. And this is it's kind of interesting because you start noticing something about yourself that you possibly didn't know before. Mouth breathing is the big one please, please, please try not to breathe through your mouth. There are all sorts of negatives. It's just cold, dry air that goes in. It contributes to inflammation and you don't get any of the benefits of breathing through the nose, which are several. There are loads of benefits of breathing through your nose and I shall tell you some while you're doing an exercise shortly. Fast breathing. I think fast breathing is one of the hardest to recognize because your breathing feels normal for you. Normal is this end of the spectrum. And then there's hyperventilating, as in, I'm about to have a panic attack at this end. But in the middle, there's breathing that is just too fast for your metabolic needs. Your body doesn't need it that fast. And so that constant over breathing that we do is leading to um, these feelings of stress in particular, where stress can be triggered quite easily. Certainly when I had chronic fatigue, I've often said that my worst symptom was anxiety because it was quite crippling. Um, and I think I was over breathing. I didn't know at the time, but looking back, I think that's highly likely. And I had no particular reason to because the triggers were so stupid, really. And I knew they were things like, what coach shall I wear today? And I was, I was getting really anxious over such, such stupid things. And that if I'm over breathing, then a little trigger is all it's going to take. Um, so we don't just um, overthink, overeat uh, and, and so on. In this society, we also over breathe. So we've, we've got three. And, and it won't just be you here. This is a large proportion of society, I assure you. Very often when we breathe through the mouth and certainly the fast breathing, it tends to be upper chest. It, it stops here. And a lot of that, that area, all of that area is really dead space because that gas exchange doesn't take place there. So you breathe it in and a lot of it comes back out again and not enough of it goes to where it's needed at the, at the bottom of the lungs. Uh, so that's one to look out for as well. And slowing it down can help. We will be slowing it down in a moment. That's what we're going to practice. Unconscious breath holds. I smile when I say this because I became aware of this. I had no idea I was doing them. It's now a thing with email. People who uh, email often when they're checking their email or when they're replying or whatever they're doing, they have this. It's got, it's got a name. It's called email apnea. And um, whether or not it relates to uh, the kind of anxiety or angst that what the heck's going to be in my inbox today or just leaning over to, to answer it, it could be either or both of those. But people stop breathing. And so it's called email apnea. It's like the sleep apnea where you stop breathing at night in, in your sleep. People stop breathing when they're doing email. But I found I was doing it when I wanted to be quiet. I get up very early because my sleep is so poor and I didn't want to wake my husband. And I noticed that in order to make myself quieter, it doesn't work by the way, I was holding my breath. Interesting, so that was, and there've been a few other uh, instances where I noticed I habitually hold my breath in order, I think, to achieve something. And there are all sorts of uh, interesting reasons why that could happen, uh, why, why that may have come about. That can be a childhood thing as well, feeling that you're uh, holding on and you're quieter and you're a little bit more invisible if you hold your breath, something along those lines. Um, if your breathing is audible, 
at rest. So when you're just sitting or, or yeah, when, you're, when you're not exerting yourself in any way, that's, a, that's another sign. It may be that you need somebody else to tell you that breathing shouldn't be audible, it should be silent. If you ever uh, uh, come across a baby who's breathing normally, you'll notice you can't hear them. You, you really, you can't hear them. Just see the little movements of their, of their, of their tummy going in and, that, and that's about all, all you get. Um, another one is frequent sighing and yawning. Um, sighing is just taking in big breaths now and then. And now and then, I get, that, that's a bit inaccurate. To take a big breath occasionally, uh, or, or a slightly bigger breath, or a yawn occasionally, that's kind of neither here nor there. But some people find they need to do it quite often because they feel they're not getting that satisfying breath. And I hear that quite a lot. That I feel like I can't get a satisfying breath. And that that's another another thing to just to be aware of. Because then if the more you know what it is that's going going wrong, for want of a better expression, the more you've got something to, to adjust and put right. So I did say I was going to focus mostly on the, the, the hyperventilating, the fast breathing. And there's a reason for this. It's because it's the one that's most difficult to rectify. And uh, it tends to also help the others to fall into place a little more easily. So there's, there's an easy way of looking at this, first of all. If you're hyperventilating, if you're breathing too fast, what does that actually look like? It's very often fast, hard breathing. That's what it usually looks like. So what's the opposite? Quite straightforward. It's soft, gentle breathing. So that's what we're swapping, the fast, hard breathing for soft, gentle breathing. Hyperventilating also tends to relate to gasping and big breaths. So what's the opposite? It's the smaller and slower breaths. So, so far we've got soft, gentle breathing. We've got slower, smaller breaths. And I've mentioned already upper chest breathing. The opposite, of course, is then the, using the diaphragm. So deep breaths where it can be a very small breath. Believe me, you've got little like turbinates in your nose that send it down. It will go. I think there's a tendency to think if I breathe in a lot, I'm going to get loads of oxygen, but actually a lot of it will end up in dead space and come out again. Get it down to the lower lobes of the lungs. However, before I continue, if the practice that we do today is challenging, which it could well be for some people, leave this one till later. You can, uh, you can address the diaphragm issue later on when you've got this one sorted out. And above all, the big factor, for a lot of people, I was hyperventilating through my nose. Uh, I'm unusual in that. Most people do it through an open mouth. And that's the biggest one straight off. If you get your mouth closed at all times, this is when you're awake, when you're asleep, but certainly when you're at rest and when you're walking, when you're exercising, low grade exercise, vigorous exercise may be slightly different, but this absolutely must happen. Breathing through the nose is so key. So with that in mind, I'd like to give you an exercise that you can have a go at. And, and it's, it's very simple. But it's not inevitably easy to do, but I'm hoping you'll be able to practice it now to know what it feels like and then use it later on daily, ideally, and get that, get that control pause up. It can take a long time for that to happen. And, and especially if you do have a, You'll know this already if you if you have a fatigue condition there, there's no gen there's no beautiful smooth upward progress it's a bumpy ride and it goes backwards and forwards and you make some progress and back it goes again and i'm afraid this is going to be the same to, to some degree with this uh, and it seems that that 20 is the is the cutoff point where you get stuck for a very long time not everybody will but don't be surprised if you feel stuck at 20 for a really long time. I don't know why it is. It just seems to be the case. Um, don't lose heart. That's the only thing I can really try to urge you to, to consider. Just stay with it because it does make a difference. It's, it's simply the case that if your breathing is dysfunctional, then something will not be working as well in your own experience of health as it could do. So something needs to improve. It's not a panacea for everything. But if it can make a difference in smaller areas, then of course that's got to be desirable. And otherwise, you, you, 
there's a tendency to maybe stay stuck and that, that seems a, a crying shame. Okay, so the exercise, I'm going to assume that your breathing is much like this at the moment. So you're breathing in and you're breathing out and you're breathing in and you're breathing out fairly normally. I'm going to ask you though, to reduce it quite significantly. I'm going to ask you to take a slow breath in and it's the smaller one as well and a relaxed, gentle and slow breath out. So it's a small, gentle breath in and a relaxed, slow and gentle breath out. So it's a slow breath in and a relaxed, slow and gentle breath out. A slow breath in and a relaxed, gentle and even slower breath out. A slow breath in and a relaxed, slow and gentle breath out. Now, if you think you can, reduce it a little bit more. If you can't, don't. Okay, stick, keep it where it is. So it's very slow breath in and a relaxed, slow and gentle breath out. Now, I'm going to ask you to keep this going for it at the pace that is right for you. So this, keep it as slow as you can where it's comfortable and as low as you can. So you have reduced your breathing. And this is, this is a reason for this. And I'm going to try and explain it while you keep doing it. And that is that if you have the, the lower control pores, so below 20, then you have a sensitivity to the carbon dioxide buildup in your body. And that's why you let, your, you, you let go fairly early. It's the buildup of carbon dioxide because that is the primary trigger to breathe. The primary stimulus to breathe is carbon dioxide. It's not just a waste gas, we have to have it. But because of the habit of over breathing, we've become uh, too sensitive to it. So ex an exercise such as this one brings that sensitivity back to where it should be. You need to be sensitive to carbon dioxide, otherwise you would never take a breath. But you're possibly, you're well, very likely to be oversensitive if your control pause is below 20, possibly even below 25, but certainly below 20. And that's what this is practicing. It's, an, it's enabling you to breathe. This is tol it needs to be tolerable, but it needs to be just as, as minimal as you can do it at a tolerable, a tolerable level so that you're training your body to accept a little bit more carbon dioxide buildup in your body. And it, it will get progressively easier if it seems a bit uncomfortable at the moment. Uncomfortable is fine. Intolerable is not. If it's intolerable, stop for a moment, take a break just for 15 seconds or so and then try again and do it at a level that you can tolerate. Um, we'll add something into this one just to just to give you something else to be doing. Imagine that uh, if you, can, you can use your finger if you want to, it's up to you, but imagine that your finger is a candle and you're bringing it quite close to your face, just close enough that you can feel the heat and it's close to your nose, that's where it needs to be and your breathing through your nose is so light and so gentle that the flame barely flickers. You do need to breathe though. This is not a breath holding exercise. You do need to breathe. So the flame barely flickers. If you prefer it, you can imagine your fingers a feather, which you put under your nose and that barely moves. It's up to you how you do it. There are several different ways. This is just to give you an idea of the sort of level of breathing that you're aiming towards. So keep it going, the slow, relaxed, gentle breath in and the relaxed, soft, gentle breath out. And this is hoping, hopefully um, gradually getting your body a little bit more accustomed to that carbon dioxide that we don't enjoy feeling because we're sensitive to it. We need to improve that feeling of uh, acceptance of the carbon dioxide going up a little bit because that's normal. We need to get back to normal. That's what's going on here. Now, as you breathe through your nose and, and keep going with it, keep, keep it going as much as you can with, a, with the imaginary candle if you want to. Um, breathing through your nose is going to warm the air going in. It moistens it as well uh, and it filters it. And best of all, there's something in your sinuses called nasal nitric oxide. And as you breathe in, the nasal nitric oxide go, gets taken into your airways and it's antiviral, antibacterial, 
uh, and it also dilates the airways, as does the carbon dioxide that you're building up. So all of these are going to contribute to making it a little bit easier over time. Of course, there's practice involved. Um, breathing through the nose also tends to engage the diaphragm more, not inevitably. And, and I've already said, if you're struggling or if this is a big enough challenge for you at the moment, forget about the diaphragm. That can come in later. But just be mindful of it as you, as you do get better at this. Doing the slow breath in and even slower exhale is going to stimulate the uh, rest, digest and recovery part of the autonomic nervous system. The slower exhale impacts on you uh, as a way of keeping you calmer. And it also stimulates the, um, the vagus nerve, which is that big nerve that you may have heard of. It runs throughout the body up into the brain and it helps you to calm down. So this exercise is a perfect one to do before you go to sleep, before you go to bed. Do, if, you, if you can do this for at least 10 minutes, possibly 15 or even 20, there's a good chance you will fall asleep more easily. And there's also a good chance that you will have better quality sleep. That, that's the, the objective. If you're serious about using this, then the practice time ideally should be um, about 60 minutes a day overall, which you break into chunks. I would start off doing a series of five seconds. So five minutes, sorry, five seconds is very short. Um, five minutes, say for a, a, in one hour, and then a, a, an hour or two later, do another five minutes and then another one, and then do your longer one at bedtime and make it up to 60 in total. If that's a bit challenging initially, Make the first week a 40 minute week and then build up to 60. But if you can keep this practice going, then you will find you will make it, uh, make changes to that control pause. That's the one where you measured your breathing efficiency. And that is best taken first thing in the morning because then you get a standardized measure because it's always the same. You've just finished your sleep. You've not done anything. There's no exertion yet. You've not You've not done any kind of uh, eating because eating can impact on breathing, all the things that can change it. So you get a better measure if you do it first thing in the morning and see how it's going. Remember, it won't be beautifully smooth and going upwards all the time. It will do something like that. But as long as the overall trend over a longer period is up, then you're, you're doing really well. And you will notice it. You will, especially if you if you move more and realize that you're not quite so breathless, you will notice it. So, and whatever other things are, are impacted by your breathing, you will start to notice changes. They may be very subtle. They may not. Some of them are quite massive. I mean, I had eczema type patches that more or less disappeared when I started doing it. When I, I raised my head as well uh, and at night on a bigger pillow so that I could actually breathe better. But you never know. I can't, I can't say for sure what will happen. Um, we're nearly out of time. There's just one thing I want to, um, you can stop the, the breathing exercise now if you want to. Just one other thing I want to um, mention, because I think it's really important. I've already just mentioned that the progress can be like this. It can be very much more like this if you're female. And there's a reason for that. The female breathing is different. It's different from male breathing. And this has been known since 1905. Who knew? Most of us don't get to hear these things because... Uh, it seems to be that it doesn't, it hasn't come into the medical world particularly. It, it's there to find and it's, it's in the scientific literature. It's fluctuations during the, the mental, the, sorry, the menstrual cycle that, that lead to this. When progesterone rises, um, breathing typically gets faster. So it means that for a, a portion of your, your menstrual cycle, you're breathing faster. Progesterone seems to be the problem person or problem hormone there. And yet when it comes to menopause, so around 50, sleep apnea increases dramatically in women, which is unfortunate. And that's because progesterone drops and its protective effects are lost. It's not just progesterone, but it's certainly one of them. So the, the being female is, is something to um, take on board. And if you are heading towards menopause, get this in place now so that you're not going through the, you're going, it, it can impact on a lot of the symptoms of menopause. And the other 
part of it, the, the earlier part, the progesterone rising in the, the second half of the menstrual cycle, those uh, symptoms of PMS that you get, they can be directly re uh, related to hyperventilation. So it's really worth knowing this because also you may need to forgive yourself for feeling that disappointment of, I was doing really well last week and now look at me, that, that horrible feeling. So just bear that in mind. Um, I'll just mention one more thing and then I will definitely stop. That business of uh, fluctuations in the, men in the menstrual cycle. There was a, a, a paper written in, I think, 2007, and it was about people with fibromyalgia, women with fibromyalgia specifically, who tested positive in half of their menstrual cycle and in some cases not the other. And you can know why that is. It's because progesterone was high in the second half of the cycle and they tested positive on the diagnostic test and they tested negative in the other half of the cycle. That's something doctors need to be aware of. And it'd be really useful for you if you become aware of the sorts of changes that can go on in your own body, whatever, whatever stage you're at. So I think I've got everything in that I wanted to there. There's obviously plenty more that, that could be done and we'll, we'll develop it in July if you're able to come back and see what we're doing there. And we'll revisit a little bit of this, but mostly it'll be getting you moving from, from hopefully a slightly better place. That, that's, that, that's our wish anyway. So if anybody's got any questions,